time. On the night of March 30th, 1993, something breached British airspace. Something that has not been explained to this day. Dozens of observers, including the military and police, reported a mysterious flying object unlike any aircraft they'd ever seen. What or who was flying unchallenged over Britain that fateful night? This man has perhaps come the closest to finding the answer. In the early 1990s, Nick Pope was running a forgotten section of the Ministry of Defense. His job, to investigate reports of unidentified flying objects within British airspace. Most of what crossed Nick's desk were simple cases of misidentification. But then came the events of March 30th, 1993. That night, Nick Pope became the case officer for Britain's greatest UFO mystery. Restricted by the Official Secrets Act, he's been unable to convey exactly what he discovered. But thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, the inside story of this incredible event can now be revealed. For three years, Nick Pope ran a little-known section at the Ministry of Defense. It was a job few of his peers wanted. Officially, I worked in a division called Secretariat Air Staff 2A. What that actually meant was I ran the government's UFO project. Nick's job was a holdover from a bygone era. The single desk he occupied at Secretariat Air Staff 2A was all that remained of a once thriving Cold War department that investigated the new and mysterious phenomenon of UFO sightings. This was part of a global concern about UFOs. In 1950, the Ministry of Defense established a UFO task force called the Flying Saucer Working Party, following an initiative by the MOD's chief scientific advisor. It was short-lived, lasting only 10 months. Its final report stated, we accordingly recommend very strongly that no further investigation of reported mysterious aerial phenomenon be undertaken unless and until some material evidence becomes available. Although the official line seemed clear, the British government continued to record and investigate UFO sightings. Contrary to what a lot of people might understand by this, the British government has had a UFO project for decades. Since the Second World War, this subject has been taken extremely seriously by the government and the military. When Nick Pope started in 1991, he was amazed by the numbers of sightings this unofficial department had collected. I received about two or three hundred UFO reports each year. But going back through the old files, it was clear that uh, by the time I'd taken up my job, we'd had probably around 10,000 UFO reports. For the three years Nick was there, an average of five reported UFO sightings crossed his desk every week. In most cases, Nick found a rational, reasonable explanation. My job was not to prove the existence of UFOs at all. My job was to assess the UFO reports and satisfy the department that was no evidence of any threat, no evidence of anything of any defense significance. To Nick's ruthlessly logical eye, 
Only one of those 10,000 archive reports stood out as a genuine mystery. The Rendlesham UFO. the fear in their voices. Rendlesham Forest is situated between what in 1980 were the joint British and American air bases of Bent Waters and Woodbridge in Suffolk. On the morning of December 26, 1980, two US patrolmen reported seeing bright lights among the trees. Two nights later, the lights returned. The deputy base commander was a man called Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. He'd heard about the UFO sightings and he was skeptical. So he threw together a small team and went out into the forest. In his own words, he went out to debunk this whole UFO nonsense. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. As Colonel Holt moved into Rendlesham, he recorded his observations on audio tape. This is a copy of his actual recording. We found a small blast, what looks like a blasted or scrubbed up area here. Now this tape is incredibly dramatic. Okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we make a sweep? Because it starts off fairly routinely with him describing moving through the forest. Let me turn around this tree over here now. He's calm, he's collected, he's businesslike. Okay, stop, stop. Light on. As things go on, he begins to get drawn into this event. Hey, this is eerie. He begins to get rather tense, perhaps a little excited. This is strange. Here, tell me want to look at the spots on the ground. We're here at 148. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers, burning our animals. They just very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. And then they see it. It has an affigmentation. You just saw a light right where? Right 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 where? Right at this position here. Straight ahead, in between the tree. There it is again. it begins to come towards them. You can hear the tension. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. You can hear almost the fear in their voices. They begin to uh, describe the strange maneuvers of this craft. These witnesses were convinced that they saw a UFO. And as military personnel on an active Air Force base, they should know better than most the difference between the ordinary and the extraordinary. In the aftermath of the incident, many of these trained observers went to ground, claiming they'd been told to stay silent in the interests of national security. The American authorities handled the official investigation and their report was never made public. As a result of that secrecy, UFO believers have long claimed that the Rendlesham Forest incident was an official cover-up. It was a fascinating story. 
But although the incident has entered into UFO folklore, Nick Pope believes that had the case been thoroughly investigated, an answer could have been found. When he took up his post at Secretariat Air Staff 2A, he vowed that if a report like Rendlesham came across his desk, he wouldn't let it drop so easily. But as Nick eased into his job at the MOD, the possibility of his tackling another event like Rendlesham Forest seemed increasingly unlikely. Each week, a slow trickle of sightings landed on his desk. Although each witness was convinced they had seen a genuine UFO, Nick routinely found conventional explanations. I took all the reports seriously. Uh, I wanted to do my level best to explain each and every one of them. And I reckon I probably got explanations for about 90-95%. Once I got a UFO sighting in, I'd run a series of checks. We knew where all, for example, civil and military aircraft were flying. So I would try and uh, correlate the UFO report with uh, things we knew about. And sure enough, we got a, a list of explanations for most of them. Aircraft, weather balloons, satellites, meteors. His access to high-level government and military data identified terrestrial culprits with monotonous regularity. To those who believed in UFOs, Nick Pope's office came to be seen as the latest stonewall in a long history of official government denials and cover-ups. But Nick wasn't one of them. With each new case, Nick's cynicism about UFOs hardened. Then, on March 30th, 1993, something happened that would shatter Nick Pope's convictions. Against all expectations, Nick became embroiled in a UFO mystery that would occupy him one way or another for the next 13 years. A massive unidentified flying object seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses across large swathes of Britain. It is a case that to this day defies all reasonable explanation. When Nick arrived at work on the morning of March 31st, 1993, he soon realized it would be a day quite unlike any he had experienced. Something had been seen over Britain's skies the previous night. Witnesses described it as a huge triangular shaped object with bright lights, which appeared to be flown in a controlled manner. The phones were ringing off the hook. I picked one up. It was from a police officer down in Devon. He and his colleague had seen a UFO the night before. I took the details. This was a fairly standard uh, part of my business. And I put the phone down. Another phone rang. Another report came in. And so it went on. Over the course of the day, more and more reports coming in, all reporting similar things. It was soon clear I had a major event on my hands. But instead of the usual individual sighting, reports flooded onto Nick's desk from across the country, and they bore a remarkable similarity. By this time, I think I'd probably got about uh, 50 or 60 reports. It was clear this was a major wave of sightings. The descriptions looked to be very interesting, detailed descriptions of a structured craft, not just lights in the sky. But above all, the quality of the witnesses. I had police officers, I had military personnel. These people were seeing these lights on the underside of a triangular shaped craft. This was the common thread running through all the reports, civil and military. In those first few hours, Nick had no conception of what the object might be. But it was pretty clear that this was out of the ordinary. The following is based on reports from Nick's Ministry of Defense case file. 9.30 p.m., March 30th, 1993. A series of lights which form a vast triangle 
appear on the western horizon. Within seconds, they've entered British airspace and are over the coast of Wales, heading inland. 10 p.m., March 30th, 1993. An off-duty police officer in the Quantock Hills area of Somerset reports a huge object flying in from the north at low altitude. These expert witness statements were so precise that Nick could accurately track the flight path of this mysterious craft. Unlike so many supposed UFOs he's investigated in the past, which seemingly appear and disappear at will, this one seemed to have a plan. As Nick traced the craft's flight path, he was chilled to the bone. The craft had traveled directly over what were then two of Britain's key military bases, RAF Cosford and RAF Shawbury. Nick soon estimated that the craft had been seen in British airspace for nearly five hours. The number of sightings and the quality of the witnesses in this case were extraordinary. And all of these accounts agreed on exactly what had been seen. One of these reports was absolutely remarkable. A craft several hundred meters in diameter, described by the witness as being rather like two Concorde aircraft seen pasted together. And this witness was hard to dismiss. The man who had spotted the mysterious craft heading inland over the coast of Wales was a police officer. The sightings spread from early evening on the 30th into the early hours of the 31st. During that time, the massive triangular object flew over a large part of Britain with impunity. 1.10 a.m., Liscard, Cornwall. The UFO is seen by another police officer who describes a triangle of bright lights moving silently north. That police officer's eyewitness account was further substantiated by reports shortly afterwards in Devon and Cornwall. They estimated the speed of the object to be in excess of Mach 2, over 1,000 miles per hour. But the most important thing wasn't what these witnesses saw, but where they saw it. Whatever this craft was, whatever it was doing, uh, the places it was going in terms of the military bases made this look like some form of reconnaissance. As he continued to analyze the sightings, Nick noticed they were grouped into two distinct waves. Those made in the early hours of March 31st, which described an object at high altitude. And another series of sightings across the previous night, describing a huge triangular UFO at low altitude, with the ability to move at breakneck speeds. To Nick, the ardent skeptic, the idea of a squadron of UFOs carrying out a reconnaissance was in the realm of science fiction. There had to be something in the 60 or so reports that would bring his investigation back to Earth. Nick turned to Britain's early warning radar systems. Designed to spot incoming ballistic missiles, these radars can pinpoint an object a few inches across from a distance of hundreds of miles. Perhaps they had recorded an object or objects that might help explain the eyewitness descriptions of the UFO. The witnesses stated that what they saw was massive, perhaps as much as hundreds of meters in diameter, illuminated by three piercing lights, sometimes hovering, sometimes traveling at speeds estimated at over a thousand miles per hour without making a sound. What the eyewitnesses described may have looked just like this. This is in fact a formation of satellites orbiting Earth, but it could easily appear as a huge black triangle, similar to the objects eyewitnesses had described. These specialist shots of satellites 
showed just how easy it is to mistake these man-made objects for UFOs. In fact, satellites were behind many of the hundreds of UFO sightings Nick had received every year at the Ministry of Defense. But not this time. The early warning radars confirmed that on the night in question, there were no satellites in the sky above Britain whose orbits matched the very detailed eyewitness reports of a giant triangular craft. Nick turned next to another suspect. The radar also records the thousands of tons of space debris orbiting the Earth, the collected remnants of 40 years of space exploration. Could the eyewitnesses have seen the re-entry of space junk? Sure enough, the records revealed a likely culprit. From radar readouts, he discovered that the spent booster rocket from the Russian spacecraft Cosmos 2238 had re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at the same time as some of the high-altitude UFO sightings. Cosmos 2238 had been launched the night before and the booster rocket had re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. The booster rocket seemed to be in the right place at the right time. Cosmos 2238's booster might well have been visible from parts of Devon and Cornwall and indeed the object would have been coming in at uh, on a southeasterly bearing and some of the times matched too. It really did begin to look as if we had an explanation. David Clark, UFO investigator and writer for Fortean Times, has seen Nick Pope's investigation records. He agrees with Nick that Cosmos 2238 offered a solution to Britain's closest encounter. If you look at what most witnesses described, two very bright white lights in the sky moving very, very rapidly across the sky with a, a trail coming out behind these things, which was the burning ion trail of the debris re-entering the atmosphere. Uh, some other people described seeing a third light, and this is where you get the, the effect of people immediately wanting to see patterns in things that are random in that they see three lights, and naturally at night, if you see three lights, you think, are they three separate objects, or are they three lights on a, on a very large object, a triangular-shaped object, if you see three lights apparently flying in formation. And you can see that this is where a lot of the idea about there being a triangular UFO came from. This thing that was seen on the 31st of March, 1993, it's one of the few cases that we can actually say with certainty what was seen, and I can say with certainty that what was seen was part of a Russian satellite booster rocket that burnt up on re-entry. That was the UFO in this case. We can put a definite full stop on this one. But Nick Pope was not convinced that the case could be closed completely. A hunch that would prove to be right. Investigations into a strange UFO across Britain on the night of March 30th, 1993, revealed a very ordinary explanation for this phenomenon. Booster rockets from a Russian spacecraft had re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at the right place at the right time. But on closer examination, Nick Pope found that this explanation was deeply flawed. Cosmos 2238 uh, most certainly could explain some of the sightings that night, probably the high altitude sightings at 10 past one. But what it couldn't do is explain uh, the whole event. It couldn't explain the sightings that uh, took place at different times. It couldn't explain the sightings which were clearly of a structured craft at low altitude. The powerful radio telescope at Jodrell Bank Observatory in Cheshire has been scanning the heavens for 50 years, most recently with the remit to actually look for signs of extraterrestrial life. Its director is Ian Morrison. He agrees that Cosmos cannot offer the solution to this mystery. Sometimes people see a pattern of lights that stay pretty much in formation for maybe several minutes at a time. To be honest, I don't believe that can be the breakup of 
space junk or anything else. Those things are very short-lived and they all leave streaks and the relative positions may well change as they travel at different speeds for the atmosphere. At best, Cosmos 2238 may explain some of the first wave of high-altitude UFO reports Nick had received on the morning of March 31st, 1993. But they could not explain the far more troubling wave of sightings, the massive black triangle seen flying at low level near two of Britain's military bases earlier that same night. Hundreds of witnesses called the police, military bases, and the Ministry of Defense to report this UFO. But there were still many more who experienced this event and remained silent. Like Estelle Burridge, a local resident, she was passing RAF Shawbury in Shropshire at about 10 o'clock on the night of March the 30th. What she saw in the sky will live with her forever. About one and a half mile into my journey, I saw flashing lights to the right-hand side of me across the sky. I thought it was lightning, but uh, I'd limped across and there was all these bright lights and they were making a noise like um, electric cables, crackling, buzzing. And I believe they were all connected up into one, making a craft. And I thought, goodness me, you know, all these lights. And they're like in an angle shape, flashing all the time. And it was so clear, and I just looked up into the sky and all these lights, and I, I just wanted to go home, you know. I. <laughs> It's really, I've never seen anything like it before and never seen anything like it since. Estelle's description matched what other eyewitnesses had reported seeing further to the south. A massive black triangular object flying at low level and capable of superhuman speeds. There were many things that made this UFO incident unlike anything Nick Pope had ever dealt with. In particular, the quality of the witnesses. Many of these he classified as expert, including military personnel and police officers. These expert observers spoke to him because he was MOD. That they spoke at all was what Nick found most extraordinary. In his experience, people from the forces, military and civilian, are extremely reluctant to report UFOs for fear of professional ridicule. Detective Constable Gary Heseltine is one of Britain's most highly trained witness assessment specialists and has been involved in London's 7-7 terrorism investigations. He's compiled a database of police officers who have witnessed UFO incidents. And he believes that these reports are factual and credible. Police officers do not suffer fools gladly. And if they say they saw something and they stand up and be counted, they pretty much tell it as it is. Because they're used to doing duty reports, they're used to giving statements that illustrate things in a chronological way as if it was presented in court. The culture of the police officer is this. It's a select club, for want of a better word, but once you're in there, you develop a reputation. You do not stand up and raise your head above the parapet unless you are sincere, because you will absolutely get crucified by your fellow officers if it wasn't true. The statements from all of Nick Pope's key experts from the night of March 30th, 1993, including serving police officers, are contained in the case file. These reports included one of the most powerful and convincing witness accounts of a UFO Nick had ever experienced. It came from two RAF police officers on duty at RAF Cosford on the night of March the 30th and the early hours of March the 31st. This is an extract from the original statement. On 31st of March, 1993, I was on mobile patrol of Leeming Road adjacent to the gravel car park 
when I saw two bright lights in the sky above the airfield. The lights appeared to be flying at great velocity in a southeasterly direction at an altitude of about 1,000 feet. The lights were circular in shape and gave off no beam. They were creamy white in color and consistent in size and relation to each other. I got out of the car. There was no sound of any engine noise. A slight red glow could be seen from these lights as they disappeared from view over the horizon. The officers immediately contacted surrounding air bases and air traffic control centers to find out what had been flying in the area that might account for the sighting. They drew a blank. There were no known aircraft in the vicinity at that time. Nick cross-checked this dramatic report with an account called in by another civilian near RAF Cosford at around the same time. It exactly matched what the two RAF police officers had seen. Creamy white lights and the unidentified object flying at an altitude of 900 to 1,000 feet. Then another extraordinary eyewitness account landed on Nick's desk. This one was from RAF Shawbury, 20 miles from RAF Cosford. The witness was a meteorological or MET officer. From RAF Cosford, the object moved quickly to the next military base, Shawbury. It was seen by the MET officer here, and the report states that he saw the lights, observed them travel towards him over the airfield, moving erratically at hundreds of miles per hour, unlike any aircraft. He described the lights as being narrow, like a laser beam, and he said it appeared to be searching for something on the ground. He'd been a Met officer for eight years and had never seen anything like it before. A Met officer at RAF Shawbury. Two RAF policemen at RAF Cosford. Men who were used to seeing a multitude of aircraft on and over their bases. These were the people who usually helped Nick explain UFO sightings. But what they reported on the night in question was very clear a low-flying craft of a type they had never seen before. Nick had to establish whether there was anything in the air over the RAF bases at the time of these eyewitness reports. At any given time, we've got an extremely clear idea of what's flying in our airspace. We have a network of civil and military radar installations, and we have the space tracking radar at the Ballistic Missile Early Warning Center at RAF Filingdales. London's Central Air Traffic Control Center at West Drayton had radar records that clearly identified an aircraft over RAF Shawbury. David Clark, UFO investigator, thinks this provides the answer. If you actually look at the, uh, the Ministry of Defence file, the RAF did a, a radar rerun re of, um, of the radar picture for, of the particular evening where the UFOs had been sighted. The result that came back from West Drayton actually identifies an aircraft overhead at RAF Shawbury at exactly the time. It's there in black and white in the file. 2.40 a.m. or 1.40 Zulu time at Shawbury, aircraft overhead, squawk. Which, so presumably this UFO was actually talking to air traffic control. This document here sets out a picture of the aerial activity that evening. I had gone to the air traffic control specialists and asked for a breakdown. What had been flying that night? Here it is, item by item. So we were able to have a look at this and see whether anything here might explain the UFO sightings. This line entry here is particularly interesting because it does talk about an aircraft overhead Shawbury. However, the crucial piece of information is in the last three digits. That's the flight level. And what this shows is that the aircraft was at a height of 20,000 feet. 20,000 feet was not what the two RAF policemen at Cosford or the Met officer at RAF Shawbury described seeing. They put the UFO at an altitude of around 1,000 feet. 
that's a significant difference. An aircraft at 20,000 feet would be difficult, if not impossible, to describe clearly. But at 1,000 feet, many people, let alone servicemen with this level of aviation knowledge, would be able to identify a known craft. These witnesses would have eliminated the obvious before putting their reputations on the line and reporting a UFO. Nick knew that a single high-altitude airliner couldn't explain sightings of a detailed, unidentified craft seen across Britain for over five hours. But he was running out of ideas as to what might provide the answers. Nick Pope had one final possibility. Could this mysterious craft have been some form of top secret prototype aircraft unknown to even Air Force personnel? At any given time, of course, the UK will be testing prototype aircraft. But the key thing here is we know where we test our own bits of kit. If something had been seen and reported as a UFO, we would have simply been told, look, this is one of ours, there's no need to look any further. Prototype aircraft, or black projects as they're called, have been the cause of many cases of alien mania. Before they were revealed to the public, America's B-2 stealth bomber and the F-117 stealth fighter aircraft were often reported as UFOs. The extreme secrecy surrounding the development and testing of prototype military aircraft fuels the conspiracy theorists and those who want to believe that we are not alone. But Nick Pope was neither of those, and as the man running the MOD's UFO desk, he could ask a serious question in the right places. Did Britain have a test aircraft over RAF Shawbury and RAF Cosford on the night of March the 30th, 1993? The answer he got back was no. That left only one other possible line of inquiry. Could a foreign government have been flying covert tests of a new aircraft over British Air Force bases without permission? For some years, there had been rumors of a secret hypersonic prototype aircraft codenamed Aurora operated by the Americans over the UK. We made inquiries through the embassy and were given government to government assurances on this. Indeed, the issue was raised in parliament and definitive answers were given. Aurora did not exist. But Nick wanted to double check. On April 22nd, 1993, nearly a month after the mysterious wave of UFO sightings, he initiated high-level contact with the US government. He wanted to know if the Americans had been operating any type of covert aircraft in British skies. My head of division wrote to the American embassy and he asked in view of these UFO sightings and in view of the rumors about Aurora whether the Americans had operated any sort of aircraft that might explain what had been seen. The response Nick received was nothing short of astonishing. It seemed that the Americans wanted to know if the British had any black projects involving a new type of aircraft. Nick realized that the American government had been investigating UFOs of their own. Back in 1993, Nick Pope had done everything in his power to solve Britain's UFO mystery. He had asked every question he could at every level, from members of the public to expert eyewitnesses. He'd examined radar tapes and satellite data. He'd even rattled the cage at the highest levels of the British and American governments. Only to discover that while Britain was conducting its investigation, 
it seemed the Americans were chasing reports of similar UFOs in their own skies. Publicly, the Americans have been out of the UFO game since 1969 when Project Blue Book was closed. This fascinating document here from the Assistant Chief of the Air Staff raises an intriguing question about that. He says, you will recall that my earlier interest was prompted by a question from our air attaché in Washington seeking advice on whether the UK had any black program. So clearly, while we were asking the Americans if they had a secret aircraft that could explain the UFO sightings, the American authorities had been investigating sightings of their own and asking if the British had something that might explain what was seen. The complete file of Nick's investigation was obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, but the copy of the letter from the Americans is missing. While the Ministry of Defense doesn't deny the letter's existence, they have no explanation for why it has disappeared from Nick Pope's official case file. But in 1993, Nick's remit was clear. He wasn't hired to chase UFOs. He was hired as a layer of protection for Britain's defenses. My job was not to prove the existence of UFOs at all. No, my job was to assess the UFO reports and satisfy myself and therefore satisfy the department there was no evidence of any threat, no evidence of anything of any defense significance. And in this case, although something had clearly penetrated British airspace and passed over two of Britain's key Air Force bases, it had never returned. So the craft, whatever it was, was not considered a risk to security. Frustratingly for Nick, the case had to be closed. Nick had to write his final report. Just like the Rendlesham case, it would be inconclusive. Type of craft, unknown. Origin of craft, unknown. Motive of occupants, unknown. Having eliminated all obvious avenues, Nick was facing an uncomfortable possibility. Could the events of that night have been a real close encounter? Ian Morrison, director of Jodrell Bank Observatory, ran the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a project better known as SETI. UFOs are interesting things. I mean, they basically mean unidentified flying object, and there are lots and lots and lots of those. That's no problem. The real question is, is a UFO an alien spacecraft? Now, my own feeling is that so far, we have not had any alien spacecraft visiting the Earth. That is not to say it cannot be done. It's very difficult, it's not impossible. In fact, to be honest, I suspect we will come in contact with another being by that route, direct contact, rather than by picking up signals from across the galaxy. Nick Pope left his desk at the Secretariat of Air Staff 2A in 1994 to take up another post within the Ministry of Defense. He had done his job to evaluate and assess events of any defense significance. But he had failed to find the rational explanation he had hoped for. This case had really got under his skin. I conducted this investigation with a completely open mind. I wanted to solve the case, just as I wanted to solve all UFO sightings that I investigated. But at the end of the day, I, I was forced to say that none of the usual explanations added up. This was some sort of exotic craft of unknown origin. I didn't know what it was. For 10 years, Nick Pope lived with the uneasy feeling that this case left with him. But officially, there was nothing he could do. Then the introduction of the Freedom of Information Act revealed, for the very first time, the full extent of Nick's investigation. And lurking within the records, the MOD's equivalent of the X-Files, was a summary of his investigation, written for and approved by Nick's MOD superiors. 
There's a statement here which is, I think, quite unprecedented in the MOD's X-Files. And it says, in summary, there would seem to be some evidence on this occasion that an unidentified object or objects of unknown origin was operating over the UK. It is possibly the most telling official statement ever made about a UFO incident in Britain. A top-level acknowledgement that there was some evidence of an unidentified flying object. These were Nick's bosses, senior-level MOD personnel, putting their signature to the fact that this was a genuine UFO. Nick's investigation had been methodical and meticulous, and now he knew that it had been taken very seriously at the highest levels of the government and military. The quality of the witnesses and the evidence he gathered did more than just convince his superiors. It convinced him he'd turned from skeptic to believer. Could it have been extraterrestrial? when we look at the speeds and manoeuvres of, of this craft, which go way beyond anything we have. I think there's some intriguing evidence to point towards that. This was not a misidentification of any, any conventional object or phenomena. It wasn't some secret prototype craft. It was a genuine UFO, a real unknown. Could it have been extraterrestrial? Yes, it could. Whatever was in the British skies on the night of March the 30th, 1993, wasn't just unidentifiable, it was undeniable. Next tonight, our Perfect Day trilogy continues with The Wedding. There's more on that in just a moment.